It's a wonderful day, a really special day. And to begin, uh, we, I guess I need to step back a little bit. I'd just like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba is on the lands of Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the, of the Red River Métis Nation. Um, it's also, we also have uh, campuses that are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, and the Diné peoples. We always say that we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. Certainly hasn't been the case in the past, but there has been an intent to move forward with greater respect for the treaties and acknowledging the harms that have been done as Canadians, Canada, all of us have been complicit in uh, the lack of respect for the treaties. So we certainly do acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and it's really our intent to move forward uh, in partnership with Indigenous communities, with Indigenous people on campus and um, really look at what we can do to focus on reconciliation and certainly collaboration. So today we're here to witness a significant achievement for the Moosehide campaign. They are presenting their three millionth Moosehide pin to the Honorable Murray Sinclair. I don't think there's anybody more worthy of, of this honor than the Honorable Sinclair. So I'd like to thank both the Moosehide campaign, David Stevenson, Sage Lessert, and Gary Snow for hosting this event here at Migazi Agamek. Thank you, Honorable Sinclair, for your attendance and your continued service to reconciliation. Thank you to Chancellor Anne Mann, Jeff LeClaire, Secretary of the University of Manitoba, for joining us to witness this event. So to get us started, I'd like to invite our elder in residence, Carl Stone of the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation to come and say our opening prayer. And I'd just like to acknowledge that David Stevenson has presented tobacco in advance. I'll step back. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Most honored guest and, uh, and everyone else who is here, Jimmy Gwich. And speaking to the tobacco that was passed to do this, I say Chimi Gwich for that. Pejigumi Gwoni in Dishna Kazmangin Lodim. Parshkanda Besi Bing and Indunjiba. Chimi Gwich went on, meaning we wanted to win. Chimi Gwich went on, you are Badan Ongum. I ask for blessings for this event, blessings for our honored guests here and that the work that this campaign, this Moosehide campaign is doing, that it reach those that it needs to reach and that we can have Mina Bay Bodies win because of that, a good life. I say to me, Gwich Wendan, aho. Thank you, Elder Carl. And at this time, I'd like to invite David Stevenson to come forward. He's the CEO of the Moosehide Campaign. Welcome, David Stevenson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cook. And I want to also uh, thank um, Gray Stone for, uh, Carl Stone, I should say, for his opening words, our elder, uh, for taking care of us in a, in a good way today and opening up our, uh, our little uh, ceremony today in a way that um, is, uh, is, holds us in the space that we're trying to uh, recreate in, in, so many of our, in so much of the work that we're doing, which is a space of honor and respect and, uh, and learning. And so thank you very much. Um, Carl, and I want to just acknowledge also, uh, you know, Danae and, and Grace Redhead and uh, Stephanie with the TRC and others who have come forward and just helped out uh, with the, the day and are, are, are showing up today to help us out. Um, I uh, just want to take a few moments uh, to share a little bit about the campaign. I'll, uh, then I'll ask uh, Sage Lesert, who is our national ambassador, uh, to come up and say some words, and she'll uh, offer the, and ask our uh, the Honourable Murray Sinclair, our elder and loved one, 
to uh, accept the three millionth moose hide pin. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll have a few words, uh, if we're lucky, from His Honor Murray Sinclair uh, to share a bit about the moment and about the work uh, from, from his experience. And then to, uh, after that, we'll have a, uh, an opportunity for a few questions um, and uh, then we'll wrap up after that. So first of all, you know, just a little bit about the Moose Hide campaign itself. Um, Sage will share more about this. It was her family who started the campaign up uh, in 2011. Uh, her family hunts uh, as has their many generations of their family hunted in what is uh, their traditional territory, which is now intersected by the Highway of Tears. Um, the campaign uh, is a campaign that started off uh, with handing out moose hides to local uh, men and boys to say we need, uh, we've got some work to do um, as men and boys to try and reclaim our, our roles uh, of being healthy and respectful, but also our role of holding ourselves and each other accountable uh, for when there's problems in our communities. And there are problems in our communities and all of Canadian society. And so the campaign is growing from a campaign that focused on uh, inviting men and boys into this space without blame or shame, but inviting them in to say there's work to do uh, and we need to, to band together to start to do this work. Uh, and the work is to create a society that is safe of violence um, against women and children. And so it's grown to a, a campaign that invites all Canadians from all gender, all along the gender continuum, and in particular, you know, our two-spirited, our relatives, um, men, boys, and people from all cultures to participate in the campaign. We invite all Canadians to wear and share about the Moose Hide campaign and raise the issue of the need to create a, a society that respects, honors, and protects all women and children. Um, with a special, uh, obviously with a special emphasis on uh, Indigenous women and children for all the reasons that we, we know. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, a bit about the context of the campaign. One of the things we do is hand out these pins for free. We consider them a medicine for social illness impacting all Canadians. If you look within your network, within your families, within your communities, this is impacting us all and it doesn't need to happen. It is, uh, it is a uh, social reality that we can change. And so we're asking everybody to uh, just take a moment to reflect on how you can personally do that. We hold a day once uh, a year called Moosehide Campaign Day, and it's a day of ceremony. It's, it's not a conference, and it's a day that is held online now, uh, started because of the pandemic. And we're inviting all Canadians to participate. Um, you can go to our website and register for the day, and it's May 12th uh, this year. And we say a day of ceremony because we challenge men and boys and we invite all Canadians again from all cultures uh, and all backgrounds, all genders, all um, from coast to coast to coast to join us uh, in, a, a, in fasting for the day. And we fast just, it's a simple fast from sunrise to sunset and you fast in a way that works for you to make sure you take care of your health and, and take a bit of a journey on that day so that we're not just thinking about this is a good idea, we're, we're embodying it in our, in our spirits, in our families, in our hearts, in our homes. Um, yeah, and so that's, that's a bit about the context of the campaign. Again, we'll have Moose Hide Campaign Day on, uh, on uh, May 12th. And, uh, and as mentioned today, we're, we're handing out our three millionth Moose Hide pin. And uh, to do that and to say some words and to share a bit about the, uh, the campaign, just uh, I'd like to ask uh, Sage to come up and, and do that. And then she'll uh, also do uh, a, a gifting of the pin. And we're really honored that uh, Carl um, would be willing to sing an honor song during that process, if that would be, yeah. Um, so Carl, uh, Elder Carl Stone is going to sing an honor song while we gift that pin. And then after that, uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back and say a few words um, after his honor has said uh, his some words. So looking forward to the uh, next piece and uh, just ask Sage to come up. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. 
maybe I'll do an AV check. How's, how do I sound? Clear? <laughs> Crystal clear. <laughs> um, Hadid, Sage, Lissert, Sadni, uh, Loretta, Madam, Slu, Paul, Lissert, Spach, um, Saikana, Lashabu, Injan, Ying, Kaktene, Keoch. Um, so, good day, friends and relatives, and the Honorable Marie Sinclair and your relatives that we have in the room, Masi Cho, thank you so much for being here with us today. And yesterday, um, I, I referred to you as, as my uncle in, in an interview where they were asking what our relationship was to you, and I just want to call my dad, Paul, and my sister, Raven, listen into the circle with us. I know that they really love you and their spirits are with us today. So just calling them in. I join you as the national ambassador of the Moose Hide campaign. Um, we're an indigenous-led grassroots movement that's asking men and boys and all Canadians to stand up speak out against violence towards women and children in Canada. This is a space that we can really make a difference. And the inspiration came from my dad and my sister, Raven and Paul Assert, in 2011. In the Carrier Territory in central British Columbia, uh, the central vein is um, Highway 16, what is now known as the Highway of Tears as a result of dozens of women having gone missing and been murdered along this highway. And we know that there are thousands of women and girls who have lost their lives as a result of this violence across Canada. And so we really started our journey in 2011 when they went home to our carrier territory and we practiced moose hunting. It's a part of our nationhood, speak our language, you are a member of the community and you practice your land medicine ceremonies. So they went out for a hunt early in the morning. My dad and my sister were learning about some of the reasons why it's so important that we do this work, why it's so important that we go out every year onto the land. And they were blessed with a moose that morning. And they wanted to take action. And, and Raven, at the time being 16 years old, recognizing the, this national crisis and the risk to her own life as a result of being a young Indigenous woman, being a woman more broadly in Canada, knowing that half of all women in Canada experience violence in their lifetime. And Indigenous women are 12 times more likely to go missing or be murdered than other women in Canada as well. And so they wanted to do something that would create a discursive shift and ask folks to take action. So we took that hide home and uh, we sat around our dining room table and uh, my sister said we have these hides and we're going to cut them up so we used like kitchen scissors and we cut them up and they were probably this big when we very first started and the evolution of, of this moose hide and the card has changed a lot over time and we wrote on these cards and we said this is the moose hide campaign and if you wear this hide you promise not to harm the women and children in your life to be personally accountable and mutually accountable to those in your family and your community and across this country. I think it represents so much of the pillars of respect and what it means to practice good medicine. And so today I'm really glad to be able to share some of that good medicine and um, looking forward to our gathering on May 12th, knowing that there will be 350,000 Canadians joining us at Moose Hide Campaign Day. And each year, we hope that more and more people will be willing to join us until everyone recognizes the pin and the principles that we stand for by wearing it. And so um, it's our goal to, to gift 10 million pieces of moose hide to folks across Canada. Uh, regardless of their age or race or gender, I, it, this issue is so intersectional that we need every single person to be involved. And so 
the one piece of good medicine that we want to offer today and a milestone is to ask for our elder Carl Stone um, to please come join me and um, we will be sharing, he will be sharing an honor song which I'm so grateful for and to mark this very important moment I would also ask if his honor Marie Sinclair would be willing to receive the three millionth piece of moose hide as, as an act of good medicine and a milestone along our journey in, in the hope to end violence towards women and children in Canada. So I'll invite our elder to share the song and um, I'll join you here, Your Honour. I'll, I'll just say a few words first. Yes. <clears throat> Bonjour, it's an honor to do this uh, and the song for for my f good friend, uh, brother, I guess, if you will. Uh, he's a little too young to be my uncle. <laughs> but uh, You're too old to be my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about four years ago, I was having a conversation. Uh, because of the Moose Hide campaign, it came around, and uh, we were talking about uh, this uh, very card here with this moose hide to a colleague uh, here that was a psychologist here for the, the students here, Dr. Natasha Ali. I was telling her a story that uh, a friend of mine, uh, we tried to start a men's group back in 1979. And uh, we sat there in the, in the room uh, waiting for the men to come for the men's group for about four months. We were looking at each other <laughs> uh, twice a week. Never happened, eh? and somebody said, "Well, maybe you're a little too far ahead of your time, kind of thing." Eh? And I was telling uh, Dr. Natasha Ali that story, and how we tried to do that back in 1979, uh, in reference to this moose hide uh, campaign that was happening. She said, "Well, why don't we do that? Why don't we make that group then?" So, like, I'm a talker. Apparently, she's a doer. <laughs> As you can see, I'm a talker. <laughs> And uh, we ended up uh, creating a men's group here called Zungi Gabuin. Uh, and it, was, it came out of the conversation of the Moose Height. And uh, two other Zungi Gabuin groups have uh, been uh, started uh, from this group. So it, it asks the question, what kind of man am I? Am I an indigenous man? And what influenced me to be the kind of man I am? Right or wrong, good or bad, kind of thing. Eh? So, and uh, the teachings that we have in there are our grandfather teachings. Uh, many of the teachers are the same teachers that taught us together, Murray. Uh, those teachings uh, are, is what we use in that Zungi Gabun circle. So I just wanted to honor that as well. Okay.
Miigwech, I am honored to receive this. I want you to know how important this moment is um, because um, I was there when this work started, this journey started, and I um, encouraged it to, to happen, and I did what I could to help it happen, and I am so very proud that you have included me in this moment, and I thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for this. This is wonderful, and it's a beautiful medallion because um, it's uh, obviously got so much work and an effort that's gone into it, as well as, of course, uh, the artistry that's reflected in here. Uh, I just want to um, <clears throat> say a few words to those who are here and to those who might be listening in that virtual world of ours, that understanding <clears throat> the importance of doing what we can to address the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is, is a key part of reconciliation. Going forward, uh, we cannot continue to allow this kind of uh, pattern to, to happen in our lives because it just shows so badly upon us as a society that we just don't care. And we have to ensure that we understand that we must care and that as a society to the rest of the world, to ourselves, to our children, to our grandchildren growing up behind us, that they must care too. And part of our commitment must be as well about educating our young men, our boys, about the importance of standing up and accepting their responsibility to change the way that our sisters, our nephews, our nieces, our granddaughters and daughters are all treated is an important part of their responsibility. In Ontario, the um, Ontario Friendship Society had a program to work with young men there that I also supported that um, was uh, centered on the, the, uh, the concept of kindness. And, and the phrase that they adopted was Kije uh, Anishinaabe and in I am a kind man. And that is the idea that we must teach our young men to be kind, to show kindness not just to each other as men, but also to um, their sisters, to their aunties, to their mothers, to their grandmothers, to their daughters, to their granddaughters, because it is with that kindness that we will all grow up to be healthy. They will grow up to be good mothers, good aunties, to our children as well. And there is nothing that makes me happier than to see my daughters interacting with their aunties who know the teachings, who, who help them to be strong in Anishinaabe Kwe. Although, when they boss me around all the time, I'm not so sure I like it. <laughs> but I'm used to it. And I'm used to understanding that, that the relationship that we have is different than the relationship that we have had that we are changing as a society. And that change centers on our understanding of our, our roles as men, understanding our roles as women, understanding our relationship as men and women with each other, and the importance of maintaining that. So I thank you for your commitment to keeping this alive and keeping it going. It's important, don't ever let it stop because you'll reach that 10 million very easily, very quickly. Uh, and as a society, just think about the fact that there are 35 or more million people in this country and we have only begun to touch the surface when we are at 3 million. 
we have a lot of work to do. So let's do it. Miigwech. They told me I have to answer your questions. <laughs> I'm a judge, I'm used to asking the questions. <laughs> but I'm also uh, quite amenable to following your direction, whatever your lead is. What do you want to do? Yeah, um, if, there are, if you're okay with that, we'd love it to open up the burning questions for uh, uh, honor. Um, and afterwards, Sage and I will also be around after, after that. I'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, <clears throat> probably more importantly, they have shared uh, much of what it is that we have learned about our relationships with us. Uh, because in the United States, the government uh, stopped coercing indigenous people to attend their boarding school system in the 1930s. And they, uh, they were vastly outnumbered. The, the one thing that they did in the United States was they they created large reservations with hundreds of thousands of indigenous people on those reservations. And that proved to be far too difficult for them to coerce the people on those reservations into giving up their culture. And in fact, it became um, an element that kept their communities alive was those large reservations and those large concentrations of indigenous people. You go down to places like the Navajo Nation where they have 600,000 people living together. Their culture is very alive. And, uh, and I've been to even some small reservations in Minnesota and uh, North Dakota of uh, Ojibwe people where the culture there is very much alive. And we bring some of that understanding and some of those elders up here to help us revive our culture and our understanding. So. Um, and in terms of the experience of the TRC and in uh, terms of the experience of what it is that we're going through, yes, uh, we do tell them and we ask for their help and, help and ask for their understanding and they're very willing to give it um, because they, um, they understand what we're going through. They understand about the trauma that we're experiencing and that this reflects our trauma. So yes, it's a, it's a two-way street. No, you look just like the pole to me. <laughs> Go ahead. One, uh, w the one thing that I want young men to know is that uh, we know that uh, not all young indigenous men are like this, are doing this. We know that there are large numbers of young indigenous men out there who are really trying, who are trying to figure out their place and how they, what they can do. And what I've done to encourage uh, young boys and men when I'm speaking to them in the schools is to say to them that even if you're not an abuser, even if you're not doing this, you have a responsibility to stop it. You have a responsibility to stand up and, and stand between your sisters and whoever might be abusing her. You have to protect those that you love as well. So don't be afraid to do that. Never be afraid to stand up for your sisters and your, your nieces, your daughters, your granddaughters, because they need you. <clears throat> Sometimes that support is very important. And so all men have a, an important role to play in this. Understanding what the teachings are, understanding what the cultures tell us is important because that helps us to feel our self-respect, but then we also need to understand 
that in order for us to work towards a relationship of mutual respect with the rest of society, we have to reconcile ourselves first. We have to reconcile with what has been done to us and come out of that negative experience in a healthier way. Thank you for the question. You want me to tell all the grandfathers of the world how they should be behaving? <laughs> We're talking about stubborn old men here. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, it is a challenge for many indigenous men who are of my age and my generation because <clears throat> we grew up in that era and we uh, developed our sense of self and our sense of direction in an era when we were denied access to our culture, we were denied access to our language, denied access to our teachings, and in fact, we're coerced into believing, we're gaslighted into believing that we were inadequate, that we were part of the problem. And, and so the result is that um, we have to overcome all of that ourselves, even as men of my generation, men of my age, we have to understand that we still have work to do to make ourselves healthier and that we shouldn't just think because we're old um, that things are going to happen automatically. We have to earn that right to be treated as an elder, to be treated in that respectful way that our elders have been treated. And there are many examples of us, um, among us, of people who learned to, to do that. My brother over there is one of them. Uh, we grew up in the same era. We went to the same teachers. We learned from the same ceremonies and participated in those ceremonies together. And they, they taught us uh, how to change. They taught us how to be better, to be better men and to be better um, grandfathers and elders when we got older because we saw what those elders that were teaching us were like and how they behaved and and that helped that helped us a lot so modeling that behavior is part of our responsibility but modeling the right behavior is is the important thing to learn to understand <clears throat> 